Well, Pat, we're here for the next episode of Talking Thrones, and all that I have to say is, Pat, when you play the Game of Thrones, do you win or do you die? Well, I think on Talking TV, we know the answer to this. We've all seen this show before, and the answer that we get for the rest of the series is you die. I feel like the shirt that I'm wearing right now just perfectly applies to what Ned Stark should have done in this episode. But people, in case you didn't notice, this is the Talkin' TV this is the Talkin' TV segment entitled Talkin' Thrones, in which we break down weekly every single episode of Game of Thrones. We're on season one, episode seven, entitled You Win or You Die. Coming up. We're officially here. We're on the second half of the season, and this is definitely where the shit goes down, uh, to quote it in layman's terms. Um, yeah. This is the this Dom, is definitely. I, I just I just thought about this. You, you say we win, we die, and I think a lot of the people in this episode actually they die. Don't I don't win. think they actually do die. There's not a whole lot of winning. Yeah. Is there anybody that's in this episode that actually makes it to the end of the series? Uh, <laughs> oh crap! Wait a minute. Oh, now you got to be thinking. Uh, well, obviously, Arya. We know Arya. We yeah, know. is Arya in this episode? I, I think uh, she's oh, oh, like, on, she's no, not no, really she, in it. Oh, wait. Oh, shit. No, I'm getting a lot of last episode confused with this episode. You're right. There's not so much yeah. actually with Sansa and Arya in this episode. You're right. Oh, Like Littlefinger goes. It's just, you know, it's, it's Ned just goes, John like and like Sam. A lot then. of people go. If, that, if we're going by that logic, then it's just John and Sam. Those are the only two. Yeah, true, true. I, I forgot about the uh, you know Night's Watch. And, yeah, uh, the people at the wall. Yeah, but even again, like of those people, it's literally just John and Sam that makes it. Every one of those guys dies as well. Yeah, like Jamie. Uh, Jamie doesn't make it. Uh, Jamie doesn't make Ty, it. Ty, Ty, Tywin doesn't Tywin make it. Cersei doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make it. it. Nope. Robert, Robert, as we know, doesn't make it. <laughs> See, when you posed that question, I had thought that you were originally talking about like this episode individually, and I'm like, oh, there are definitely winners, but I didn't realize you were talking about like the grand overall scheme of things, and yeah. I'm like, oh, do, no, do, in that case. Do you think they did that on purpose? Like, pretty much, uh, oh, we know all these characters are going to die, let's just make this episode about I that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They could have. It, it, it's very, very plausible as far as that goes. I mean, I, I still think that George R.R. R. Martin's overall goal is just to murder everyone in this show like i think he even like had written at one point like the final shot of this entire series would be just the winds of winter flow over a row just like miles upon miles of gravestones basically well it could have been like a you know a princess bride type of thing where uh, someone's reading a book and then nuclear winter over the world True, um, true. You know, that could have been the... <laughs> oh, that's the, how that one ended. And ended the series. Um, I always wonder. For the mo- yeah, I don't know. It, it, whatever. That, it's uh, maybe a little bit of a, a bad joke there. But uh, for the it most part... Also bad jokes on the Talk of Thrones podcast. I think we, we, we talk about this often where, you know, it's um, essentially like the old generation, the people that have the established order and they're, you know, sort of worried about the Game of Thrones. They're the ones that end up sort of losing and dying and, and sort of being, we, you know, weeded out. And then you have essentially the younger generation take over at the end of the uh, series. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, you know, I wonder how much we see that theme throughout the entire thing. It's definitely, this is the beginning of that. This is the, this episode, right? We talked about this with the last two episodes, right? Golden Crown and uh, Wolf and the Lion, where we're basically like, we're getting set up for like, the shit is about to go down between the Starks and the Lannisters. And we're going to see that ripple effect and how it spreads and affects overall the rest of the realm, right? We see it obviously with Catelyn's actions. We're going to see it up in Winterfell later on with Rob's response the next episode. And then over subsequent seasons, how it affects other characters to begin to come into the fold, you know? Like, again, it's always been to me the major, um, you know the, the 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 staying power to me that Game of Thrones has is having these one events kind of spread out and ripple and encompass everyone, kind of like how it happens in real life, basically. And this is, I feel like, the culmination of it, right? But it really, it's weird because these this series of episodes that we find ourselves in in the second half of season one, right? We spent the first four episodes like with so much build up and so much slow stuff. But there's a reason why it was so needed, because we see how, like, just one thing constantly leads to another as far as how the conflict in this entire show goes. 
And the interesting thing about this episode specifically is that it really is, like, to me, the perfect, like, house of cards, how it's assembled. Like, how it's assembled from the opening shot all the way, you know, followed by the confrontation, and then all the way, all the working pieces, even with the subsequent storylines, all the way up to the end of that final ultimate portrayal, right? Like, there's a lot of big events that happen in this episode, right? John takes his vows. You know, the Cal Drogo officially decides that he's going, that the Dothraki are going to ride out and conquer Westeros for Daenerys, right? Ned confronts Cersei with the truth, right? We finally get introduced to Tywin Lannister, right? The big uh, Lannister patriarch, right? Who's the only man in the Seven yeah. Kingdoms who could, like, have any control over Jaime and Cersei. And, like, you see that, and like, this guy... that's the opening of the episode, right? Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. Jaime is in his father's tent, and essentially, uh, Tywin is just casually butchering. Skinny like, butchering it. You're very symbolic again. Like, it, is it a deer or, or is it a giant? It's a giant uh, stag. Boar. It's a stag, basically. Oh, it is um, a stag. Okay. It is a stag. Again, the, the symbolism of like first, it, right back to the first episode with like the stag with the spear with, with, with its with its antler stuck through the wolf's throat, right? That the wolf would get betrayed by the stag, and now we have the lion just skinning the stag. Basically, a lot, lot of animal symbolism here, just in this first season. Yeah, and I think you know that conversation that he has with Jamie, clearly Tywin's disappointed in Jamie's choices, and there's a little friction there. And yes. he goes into this whole diatribe about like you know, oh, it's we'll be you know your mother's rotting in the grave, I'll be rotting in the grave, you'll be rotting in the grave, Tyrion will be rotting in the grave, and the only thing that lives on is family, and we don't want to end up like the Targaryens where our family just falls apart. And I think, you know, this is like a really strong scene. Talk about self-fulfilling brings, prophecy right there. Yeah, but it brings up this whole idea of, you know, the families and those being really important to this world. And, you know, I don't know. Do, do you think that this series really handles that theme uh, perfectly throughout the, the entire series? Or do you think at some point it sort of drops this idea of like the families at war? And it just focuses on those individual characters that we actually you know, no, actually, I, I think that it enacts exactly what it intended to. Weirdly enough, I think that's one of the few kind of overarching themes that actually does get well translated to the finale, which is that that idea in and of itself is inherent. While it's true in concept, the, the overall practice of it by the characters is inherently bullshit. Because even though Tywin may believe in that idea... But he's perfectly willing to throw his own son that he does that he doesn't like to the wolves, right? And then he gives that one flimsy excuse to Tyrion at the end of season three. But we know for a fact Jamie doesn't care about that. We know for a fact Cersei does not care about that at all. The only thing she cares about is her kids and her own like kind of fledgling grasp. And like I said, when when her kids are all gone, dead and gone, like we see what happens there. I think Tyrion does realize it, but by the time he does, it's too late because he realizes that the only remaining members of that line don't care about him and completely disown him, right? And that's why he's, like, content with, like, letting the family lineage die with him, you know? Like, I, I think that's also part of the reason why he was fighting so hard for Jamie and Cersei to survive is so that the family, the, the Lannister name, could in a weird way live on through them because he knew that it wasn't going to with him, right? But ultimately, right, like, that's... I, weirdly enough, I think one of the things that, like, the show gets right kind of throughout is that that traditionalist idea of these ancient family lines that will continue forever on, even that comes to an end, right? Nothing lasts forever. Everything is ultimately built on this house of cards that is destined to crumble, right? It's why we have people in there like Littlefinger and Varys to kind of remind us that, yeah, at the end of the day, this whole idea of family lineage, it ultimately doesn't matter, right? It's a good idea in concept, right? But the problem is the way that it's practiced by the royal family is simply only as, like, a means to flex and continue to take control, that idea inherently in and of itself is rather outdated. And it's kind of the destruction of that idea that is one of the many that Martin chose to pursue through his through this series. Awesome. You know, it's, it's uh, I guess, you know, I don't, you put it in such eloquent words, but I don't know if like the destruction of this family line is like a predominant storyline. You know, it definitely does happen because, you know, at the end of the day, it's sort of like a council of, you know, survivors of this sort of clash between the Starks and, uh, you know, the Lannisters. And, you know, it basically it, after this last big war of families happens, you know, we're left with this idea that that will never happen again. But I don't know. It, it seems like it's a very much becomes an undertone of the show than an all out sort of in your face affair uh, so I, I don't know if this show you could say it's like the downfall of the family names and you know pro 
proliferation of, you know, the the idea of uh, more uh, collaboration across families. Right. Uh, but I guess it's because it ends right there at the the moment where it's like, oh hey, we got to do something better. Right. Let's let Tyrion decide. <laughs> in which it's handled wrong but i think the kind of overall point that i'm getting at is this idea of kind of these traditionalist tendencies thinking that they can last forever right we, we talk about this right part of the problem of like destabilization of civilizations is their unwillingness to change and adapt with the times and honestly like at certain points like not even just unwillingness just inability to do so right and that's kind of what we see happen to a lot of the previous generations i feel like that's a big thing is that th- that to me is the predominant theme of this episode specifically it's quite literally you win or you die you adapt to the new way or you die like there's no alternative in this world right and like so we talked about that with the scene with tywin right and i feel that's completely summed up next in the next big confrontation the next scene after that which is ned's confrontation of of cersei like ned foolishly yeah. right varus even calls him out on it later on like this was the beginning well, of the uh, end for ned this official confrontation and conversation yeah right this, here. this is where the episode gets its namesake because yep. ned is sitting there next to a fountain and, and cersei comes up and i love the shot know, too they, when she walks up purposely shooting oh, you're, like, you're, above, like he's looking up at her and her yeah, head is exactly. blocking the sun well it's it's interesting because like you know at this point he was stabbed through the leg he's sort of walking on a cane you know, he's sitting down and they decide Arya to even asked him, it's like, is your leg hurting and affecting your decision making? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's something that a child would say. Yes, it <laughs> but, is. But for the most part, he's looking up and he's in a weak position. And then, you know, so physically we see him in a weak position. But then he goes ahead and he's like, listen, you know, I know the truth. You know, your children are basically yours and Jamie's, you know. Yep. Etc. 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 And he reveals all this information that he has, and I don't like. He doesn't realize that he's still in the weaker position. Like it's, we physically see him in a weak position, and then we hear him sort of, you know, try to, you know, get the upper hand and say Robert's anger is going to be chasing right. you across. Kind the of trying to use Robert as yeah. a shield in order to protect himself. Like, dude, have you seen? Rob, again, an- another example of like how Ned is setting himself up for failure there. It's like, dude, you literally saw how Robert kind of overrode you on a decision between you and Cersei. Like, dude, do not expect that Robert, e- even if Robert did not did survive the ordeal that he goes through in this episode, right? Like, dude, you can't consistently hide behind Robert. Like, he does not yeah. have the, 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 the might and the will that you think he does. Well, it goes back to that scene where Robert's talking about the, the first person that they ever killed. Right. And it's right. He, he actually mentioned like, I'm surrounded by Lannisters. They're everywhere. They're in my guard. They're in the court. They're in whatever. And the Lannisters have basically secured a strong position in King's Landing. And here's Ned basically saying, you know, this noble thing, like, Hey, listen, your children are not the proper heirs, you know, Stannis is, and I'm going to give you all this information. I know this is true. I'm going to bring it out. And, you know, Cersei's like, bring it, you know, Go almost ahead. like uh, Dwayne like, Rock Johnson, right? It's like, she even bring literally it. says, <laughs> you know? first of all, not only is she not scared of Ned, she's not at all scared of, of, of Ned telling Robert, because mostly because of the events that she's already set in motion, because at least for right now, Cersei is 10 steps ahead of everyone. Right. So she's already kind of set this chain of emotion of emotions and event that are going to result in Robert not being able to do anything about it. Needless to say. Yeah. And then, well, my big question is, um, yes, before this, you know, oh, I, I love what, this point what, that you have here was Robert. Right. You know, basically the, the plot to kill him during the hunt. Was that in motion before Ned confronted her? Yes. Or yes. she that, confronts Ned. And then you know, he confronts uh, – Ned confronts Cersei and then Cersei just goes and, and sends a letter like make sure he so doesn't return. Think about it, so think about it this way, right? Lancel was already feeding Robert or you know, giving Robert the wine in the last episode before Ned even found out the truth that it even planted. Cersei had been planning this for a for like a while. Well, I have a feeling that Cersei had been planning this since the first episode. Cersei had been planning this for a while. Like there were a lot of working pieces that had to go right for this plan to work, right? Like say say Rob like what what if Robert hadn't found anything on that hunt, right? Like, yeah, he was on the hunt, but say like it was just an off day and he didn't find any game and he comes back in one piece. It didn't matter how much wine he had. Like 
If, if they don't find that bar, Robert Baratheon walks out of that Godswood and her whole plan, she's like, fuck, I got to try again, you know? And then maybe then maybe it does fuck up. Like, there were, there were a lot of working pieces. Like, she had had to have had that plan in motion for so long. Like, I'm talking, like, potentially, like, before, like, right from the minute that John Aaron died, potentially she'd had that in motion set up, you know? Well, do you think it's like, oh, hey, you know, John Aaron's gone. Things are a little bit better for our conspiracy. And then, oh, damn, Robert wants to get Ned. And then as soon as they sort of travel up there and she sizes him up, she starts with her schemes. Right. And then it's like. Because remember, the whole thing, the whole thing that we have to keep in mind as far as that goes, right, is because even though the first season is so focused on the conflict between the Starks and the Lannisters, right, we forget that. And this is what I feel like, again, the future seasons of the show do such a good job of filling us in with is that this ultimately beforehand was never meant to involve the Starks. The Starks, as Varys mentioned in episode five got involved almost by accident when Bran stumbles upon it because the Starks had been out of the loop for so long. They'd been out of the loop for like the last like 15 years. There hadn't been a Stark in King's Landing since the attack on the Capitol. So because the Starks had been out of the loop for so long, right, it was only by chance when in a way the Lannisters almost kind of caused their own fault because it was because it was the death of John Aaron, right, which, as we know, was not caused by the Lannisters. It was caused by Littlefinger, right, in order to kind of stir up this conflict, as far as that goes, that caused the events to be set in motion, right? So the the, the crazy thing is that even though we are continuously told in this season that the Starks are the protagonist and the Lann- Lannisters are the antagonist, in hindsight, it really is a matter of now both of them are just different sides that have been pushed against each other for this reason. It just so happened that this one side had this incriminating secret that they would do anything to keep secret, right? Cersei even mentions it in the first episode that John Aaron happening was like a blessing in disguise. Like, you don't say that to me, to me at least. Like, I, I get it, like, right, for the purposes of, like, you know, because we have this history of villains always admitting what they did behind closed doors. But, like, just because of the context of what we now know about this show, that's not something you say if you're the one that's committed the deed, you know? Yeah, like, to me, it, Cersei doesn't say that, right, if she's in, if she, if, right, because true, at the time, right, we didn't true. know about the whole little finger thing, but Cersei's not saying that to Jamie or, or vice versa, however it happened, if they were actually to blame for it, you know? So, yeah. and I also like that, how yeah. uh, Tywin basically chastises Jamie for the game that they're playing, right? right. It's like, right. you're basically putting our family at risk. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's really because of, you know, what does he say? He says something about like, you have the benefit of being young, but yeah. it's because of that, you know, fact that Cersei and Jamie are relatively right. young, that basically they're making these mistakes and they're getting their family entangled into this battle with the Starks. And I think you're right. The Starks were a wild card. They were. That were, th- that were thrown into Cersei's and Jamie's uh, plan. Way. And that sort of is what uh, basically sparks the issues for not only uh, everybody else in Westeros, but the, the Lannisters themselves. Not to mention the, the, the peril that they put their, their own brother in, because Tyrion is dragged into this simply by proxy of his last name when he had nothing to do with it. And also when he found, because by the time he found out, the, because he was just as in the dark as everyone else about the information. Like, I mean, I'm sure he had some idea, like he obviously knew about Jamie and Cersei's relationship, right? But I don't know if he knew the extent to like, of, 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 Cersei's children's parentage as far as that goes so that's something else to consider as far as that goes just how that kind of drags Tyrion in and how that ends up you know because Tyrion even though he doesn't start off that way Tyrion ends up becoming a crucial piece in the downfall of their house that builds towards the end right that's the case in both the books and the show because him killing Tywin is really I I mean it it technically starts with Joffrey right I mean it technically starts like with the war but it really does start with Joffrey and then Tyrion killing Tywin is like the final like one of, one of, like, the big final nails in the coffin that kind of leads to the destruction of the Lannisters because from there it's just, even even in the books, too, it's just ultimate pandemonium. Well, um, yeah. well there's a lot of things. Like, you know, what happens to Cersei later on basically brings shame to the, the right. house. Right, right. So anyway. Well. Um, Jamie getting for, his hand cut off. It, it's a lot along yeah, the way. There, but there's yeah. a lot that happens to the Lannisters yeah. but so to, the, that, to show that's that downfall. Pretty, that's, yeah, that there's per, so the next like kind of the second act of this right. There's kind of like a string of like micro scenes that kind of add to the theme. Right, you have Littlefinger in the brothel, kind of like coaching Ross on what to do. You have like Theon trying to encroach upon Osha. They've been doing like a little bit with Theon, like kind of like because Theon didn't yeah. have that much to do in the book, so they're like they're having him do that much. And then Osha kind of reminds us, it's like, hey, the White Walkers, you know, when Lewin well, yeah, tries yeah, to yeah, talk yeah. to her. But like the thing with Theon is like. Um, 
you know, he kind of uh, goes in there and, and sort of puts uh, her down, you know, and basically, oh, you're out of place here. And he, he right. also like towards the end of that conversation tries to take advantage of her. And I yeah. think that's really, you know, uh, showing us like what's going to ultimately happen to Theon. They're trying to make him like a little bit of a womanizer and yeah. uh, sort of like this young man that sort of prides himself on, you know, his, his conquest, so to speak. Uh, because, you know, if we've seen this show before, we, we ultimately know uh, that that's going to be, uh, you know, his sexuality is going to take a direct assault um, yes. when he gets captured Clearly. by uh, uh, Ramsey later on. That's a good so, point. I didn't. I didn't so think I, that I think this is a little point. scene where they just sort of pepper that in there, like you yeah. know, hey, he's a little bit of a young playboy, uh, but Master Lou in there, you know, reminds him, like, you know, you're sort of a guest slash prisoner too, so don't push your luck. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm def- definitely agreed as far as that goes. It, it, it's I, I still find it funny, like the one line that Osha has, like Lewin's like, I won't be here the next time he does that, and Osha's like, Oh, please, I've had worse than him. Like he's just a boy, you know. As far as that goes, like constantly, <laughs> yeah. this season is literally just a season of everyone taking shots at Theon, and I keep thinking of like Theon's future actions, like almost all stem from just like everyone consistently taking shots at him for like no reason because he's kind of like I know everyone kind of like hates his dad for like starting the rebellion unnecessarily, and like the Greyjoys are kind of like I, we were going to talk about that a lot next season when the Greyjoys like try to make their claim but like the Greyjoys to me are just like consistently trying to like be bigger than they really are when they're like kind of literally just up jumped like raiders and pirates and the fact that they, and they keep failing miserably and getting smacked around for it and Theon is kind of like the first example of that but we have a quick scene at the wall where John and Sam are standing on top of the wall and they see Benjen's horse return famously without Benjen the kind of the first thing to fire as to what's to come right but the big scene obviously, is right after Ned confronts Cersei, oh, how conveniently, Renly runs up covered in blood, like, covered, like, just caked in dry blood. I'm like, Jesus, did this boar, like, chew on chew on Robert? Like, did he play with his food a little bit? Like, like how did this go as far as that goes? Like, I, like, I get it, like, he was clearly impaled, and, you know, they didn't have modern-day medicine as far as that goes, but, and, like, he was clearly very, very, very drunk, but, like, that's always been, like, one thing that's, like, always kind of stuck out in my head. I'm like, I, like, man, if there was one scene that was cut an off-screen scene that was cut that I just would have loved to have seen. It's freaking just the, just the visual imagery of Robert wrestling with this boar that's like got its freaking tusks stuck in his stomach and him like pulling out the knife and stabbing it in the eye. And also like how, how kind of, I don't know, like, is it weird? Did you find his death, his death scene like underwhelmed? Like I know what happens off screen as far as that goes, but it's kind of just like him sitting there like tired in bed, like slowly dying. Well, and, like, I, I think, doesn't I look think as bad, but yeah, I think this might be like the first season limitations. Right. Uh, and we That's come across it up too. Yeah. We come across that a couple times in the next few episodes. And I, I think it's just they couldn't film that scene. Like it, it would have been too complicated. It, yeah. it would have been too expensive. The whole thing is like that something in the, in the, in the about book, that. it's meant to seem that like the boar like kind of did like in a weird way. Like remember the scene in Godfather Two when Vito kills the guy who killed his dad, and he like kind of like rips it up his chest. Like that's kind of like what it's supposed to be. And like like the whole thing is that like Robert's like guts are quite literally hanging out of his stomach, and that it's like this kind of makeshift like freaking sash that Meister Pycelle has constructed is the only thing that's keeping them intact. Like, he's literally, and they, yeah. they, they even say, they're like, we have no idea how this dude is alive. Like, this dude should be dead, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like um, there, there's a little bit of a, a issue with how it's presented because, you know, how does a boar, like in my mind, how does a boar take Robert down right uh, and, and put well, him I mean, on his the, the whole incentive yeah. is that he was so drunk by the time right because we don't know how much wine has been consumed between the last episode and now that he's so drunk that he can't like get in the proper form but also like again it's just there's so many questions that are raised it was very clear like they just needed an excuse to get Robert Baratheon off screen so they could get killed so that they could get this going as far as that goes but it's fair and it's very obvious because there's so many different logistics like I said where I'm thinking about like okay how was he holding the spear can he barely stand did he not like Throw the throw the spear in time, like for. Yeah, for, for I, I when think the they could have done. Him, like, if if they shot a scene, they could have left some mystery of like, oh, was he killed and the boar was framed, or did the boar actually get him? You know, like they could have they could have done some mystery <laughs> to his death. Like, I know, I'm serious. I th- I think you know if. 
Yeah, there's, there's, always, there's a lot of different points where I'm like, they dropped this case kind of too quickly. Yeah, that, he's like, always surrounded by Ned, Lannisters. Yeah, you know? Ned, Ned and, quite literally talks to Selmy and Barris after, and he's like, how did this happen? And, and Selmy even says, like, the boy Squire kept giving him wine. And Varys is quite literally pointing it out. It's like, wow, so Ned can figure this out, but Selmy can't? Like, come on. Like, like Selmy's not a stupid guy, so. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, it definitely comes across as a weird scene. Yeah. Uh, like, Robert does have to die to set in motion yeah. the rest of the season. Right. And I, I get that. But it, it, it's sort of one of those, like, question marks. Like, this is the way you handled it, you know? Right. So... It was a weird moment for me, even in the books, where I'm like, this is Ned's best friend in this scene, and, like, this is childhood friend in this scene. It, it, I don't know. It feels short-changed as well. Like, I know it's weird because, like, we made such a big deal about Viserys' death last week, and, like, it, it, but, like, for, for Robert to, like, have such an imposing presence in episode five, like, the way that he did, and then for it to, like, kind of end this way, I don't know. It's, like, it definitely feels like a plot convenience thing more than anything when he was established as, like, such this imposing and, like, massive force to be reckoned with, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree, and you know, it's it's one of those things where I, this sort of sets in motion the whole Ned is going to, you know, basically write down Robert's sort of last will and testament. Hey, Ned is the protector of the realm. Uh, Joffrey is not necessarily to read, uh, lead directly. Ned's going to sort of be the Lord Regent until Joffrey grows up. Right. And, you know, basically. No, Cersei's going to love that. Yeah, so exactly. And and Ned basically understands that his claim to being the Lord Protector is is relatively weak. And so eventually he sort of, you know, talks to Littlefinger and Littlefinger tells him point blank, like, you need to seize power. You need to basically do X, Y and Z, including, you know, if Joffrey seems to be, you know, a problem hey, then we sort of get rid of him and we put Renly... And we put in, Renly in, in there, yeah. In which there. So so I wanted to talk to you about that as far as that goes, right? So obviously we know that, like, Ned's honor, right? Because this is something that, like, kind of always bugged me, right? This is definitely the point in the books where I was like... I, I, I was I was starting to get bugged because this was the point in that first book where I felt like there was a lot of problems. Like, I've been up, up front about this before. Set up for me in TV shows and books has never really been, like, a problem with me because I know it's so crucial and sometimes some of my favorite parts and some of my favorite elements from storytelling in general can just come from the setup phase in general before we, like, kind of get to the, oh, shit's gonna hit the fan phase. But this is something that always kind of bugged me, right? Like, when you're right. Like, obviously, we know Littlefinger is a hell of a lot smarter and obviously knows his way around way more than Renly Baratheon, right? We know Renly dies in the next season within the first five episodes and Littlefinger makes it at the very least all the way up until the penultimate episode season before he's done dirty i have more notes on that later on but my big thing is why in the hell didn't ned at the very least take renly up on his offer like even like like i get it right so here's the thing right ned doesn't take renly up on his offer because he doesn't want because he believes that stannis should be king right but he actually is for a minute fooled that littlefinger is gonna help him install stannis as the king, right after they take down the current regime, like I, I get it, right? Well, yeah, it's but it, it's, it's also Ned's it's also go little it, but like, Littlefinger tells him that he should go with Renly, right? Littlefinger, you know even what tells I mean? Him. So like, it's like, and, and like, then he has the goal to be like, oh, will Renly be joining us? What you think Renly's gonna stick around for? What's gonna come next? Like, dude, like if Ned basically teamed up with Renly, Littlefinger would have fell in line with yes. Renly and Ned. And yes. then he, the Starks would have basically been ruling King's Landing, pretty much, instead of the Lannisters, right? And, and, and we wouldn't have had a show. Basically, it's it's well, yeah. Whole, well, we right. could have had a show because there would still be a reason yeah. to, to go to war. True, because true. Ty, Tywin would then sort of turn around and try to free Cersei and. True. The Joffrey, difference being you, though that the the difference being though that the Starks are actually in a position of prominence from the start, rather than constantly having to like up, have this constant uphill battle, right? Because then because Rob obviously has to step in and kind of take over from where Ned failed, and then everything there happens. You know, I, I, I we'll have to have a contest later on at the end of season three, right? When Rob dies with the Red Wedding, is who made the dumber decision, Ned or Rob? Because I'm constantly at a loss to see who made the dumber one. Because like every time I think I'm like, oh, Rob did a lot of things that Ned didn't by like avoiding the King's Landing in general, and then. And I'm like, yeah, but then he broke his wedding vow and basically gave the incentive for 
some of his squad to join the other side. So I'm constantly at a loss as to who made the dumber decision ultimately in the battle for the throne, Ned or Rob. But we'll get to that in a minute. Rob's not even in this episode. Well, uh, you know, hey, Dom, it's, Ned, it's... Trusting Littlefinger or marrying the wrong girl. It's like, especially uh, considering that, like, that was another thing that was, like, blatantly changed from the Yeah, book. I think it's, like, father, like, son type of thing. Yeah, so, definitely, uh, definitely. But anyway, uh, I, what I will say is, you know, one of the other favorite parts of this, uh, this episode is really... Uh, the scene where John sort of gets his role as steward. Yes, and he's when they officially angry. take their vows in the watch. It's he like I wanted to be, a, I wanted to be a ranger, yeah, etc. Oh, I keep forgetting that this is, even though I technically I do still love John's arc throughout like the show up until the last season. I'm I'm with John even up until season seven. It's only in season eight when he completely yeah. loses all of his authority that he loses me. But like I'm with John for the entirety. But man, I forgot what, what he really but, is like but, an, the equivalent of an emo kid in this first season. He but really the is. awesome, the awesome thing is like when he's doing his. Emo emo freak out yeah. and sam is trying and to calm sam him down comes. and then like, pip comes pip in is, with his he's, he's right that there awesome. and, and john john is just like it ain't fair and then pip is like you damn uh, right it's you not fair fair like he, like he you want to talk uh, motherfucker you want to talk about fair yeah so pip up the reveals way you know pip reveals that he's like was a musician of some kind like singing at the tavern and then some lord sort of hit on him. Yeah, and, made, a, made you know, a pass. Not just hit, made a pass at him. Yeah, exactly. And he basically refused. And because of that, the lord, you know, lied and said, hey, this guy basically just tried to steal some stuff or whatever. He just he just basically uh, threatened Pip and said, you're going to the wall or I kill you. And basically that's why Pip is, is there. He's revealed that because he refused someone – uh, you know, in, in sort of this sexual past that that's why he ended up at the wall. And, you know, other than that, he would have been living a pretty comfortable life, you know, within reason. And that's what's unfair. Like John just being a steward. Right. John, at the end of the day, uh, chose know, to be there. Right. Exactly. Almost 100 percent of his brothers did not choose to be there. And Sam makes a good point. Like he's grooming you as, as right. you know. Your, Meaning that he sees something steward. in John, right? Like, again, like kind of the, the whole setting up the next generation to replace the old. Like, that is very, very much a present oppression theme in this episode, right? It, it's even there with Littlefinger, with the moments with Littlefinger and Theon that we talked about, right? It's even there kind of in a strange way with Daenerys' arc, right? Where Daenerys, even though, right, she's trying to, her whole majority of her arc in this episode, right, is trying to coax Khal Drogo to go and make the moves, right? And that, you know, in a way that Viserys did not succeed right in a weird way it's kind of the same thing where they're kind of setting themselves up for the future right john obviously with being groomed for command and daenerys even though she doesn't realize it yet to be in charge of this large you know be learning how to control this large force this large army so that eventually she can lead them on to this conquest right i I definitely find that very fascinating and I think the incentive as well for her kind of, you know, with, with the whole assassination attempt, right? And, and, and this is because this is also a big moment for Jorah, too, because at the end of the day, right, even though Ned... But this is the other thing that I forgot to say as well earlier with the Ned Robert scene is that Robert ultimately on his deathbed does have a change of heart about Daenerys. I think that's the one moment, emotionally ringing moment, right, that really stands out because he's like, let her live because he realizes in his last moments, he's like, yeah, I've made a mistake. I should, this is nothing to be scared of, right? At least yeah. in the moment, right? So so one of the things that, you know, I wanna, I'm glad you brought this up. So I want to segue into sort of our Gachiverse segment because we mentioned that we wanted to talk about oaths. Yes. And there's a couple of oaths that take place are, you know, don't take place in this particular yeah. episode. So Jorah is actually one of them. You know, basically he's walking around the market and all of a sudden this little kid comes up to him and hands him a piece of paper and says, listen, this is your royal pardon. You can go back to Westeros. And then he realizes, oh, that means there's some that assassin. There's something that's about to go down here in the market. And so Jorah has to make a decision. Like he sort of got kicked out and made this sort of attempt to get back get this pardon he basically was a spy for robert's uh you know king uh uh, kingdom and you know now he has his pardon but he basically sees something in daenerys he's made this oath to her and now that you know it's not really uh her brother that is going for the crown right it's her her. like jorah has seen this sort of growth in leadership in her and he makes a decision right there on the fly to really, you know, change what he really wanted and really give a personal oath 
to Daenerys, which we'll see actually, uh, you know, he sticks to for the rest of the series. Yeah, Jorah for the first couple of seasons is an interesting character insofar as he's there to assist Daenerys and, and like give her context, right? But he also serves an interesting role because he's spying on her, but then he actually joins her forces as far as that goes. But he, but then later on, like the way that they utilize Jorah, at least for the first couple seasons, I think is really interesting. And Eric Thorpe, our loyal, loyal follower, I actually wanted to bring up a, a comment that he made a little earlier than we usually do. But he asked an interesting question, which is if Robert didn't change his mind like on his deathbed, do you think Daenerys would have been successfully assassinated at some point? The only reason why I don't necessarily know if that equates in fact actors in because I mean we said it by the time Robert makes the decision right to not have Daenerys killed Varys tells Ned it's already too late the Raven's been sent you know so like the attempt is already underway so I I, the only reason why it's like I I don't necessarily think it would have made a difference as far as that goes well you know what I will say is that I guess you know Cersei and Joffrey are going to know about his change of heart and they probably they probably don't even care about Danny. They, they don't to be even honest care. With you. The Lannisters make but, it clear in multiple points throughout the rest of the show that they do not care about Daenerys. Like literally, yeah. the most that they do, the most that they do, which is again a slight change from how it happened in the books. I'm going to be bringing that up a lot. Is in season four, Tywin sends out the letter that exposes that exposes purposefully has one of Varys's kids, you know, little birds, um, inform Sir Barristan, who we know is working for her at the time, that exposes Jorah. And that's, but that's the most that happens. And by the time he does that, like, it's already too late. Like, Daenerys has already, like, become a force to be reckoned with in Essos as far as that goes. Yeah. So the Lannisters do not care one bit about Daenerys in a way that, like, kind of Ned and Robert did. But then, obviously, you know, they died and the Lannisters took over King's Landing. So, so also, uh, another thing about oaths, right? You know, we, we've been talking, that's what we're sort of focused on. Yeah. Like, we've been talking about how Ned. You know, he's sort of oaf driven, you know, he's he's loyal right. to his friend, he's royal, uh, loyal to the sort of order of succession. You know, it's one of those things that that sort of is what gets him killed. And then we have John, right? He's at the wall. And mm-hmm. in this episode, he goes before the old gods and he takes his oath of the Night's Watch. And almost immediately, you know, when they see Benjen's horse return without a rider, He's ready to go out. He wants to yeah. go find, you know, and it's like, oath be damned. And, you know, as we see in the next episode or two, you know, when Rob marches to war, you know, at, at some point, um, basically John is is ready to throw the oath away and sort of go to war with his brother. But again, you know, the Night's Watch, his new brothers in arms, Sam, Pip, and uh, some of the other fellows, basically drag him back to the wall and and basically say like, this is your new life. Now you have to basically accept that you took the oath and you have to live up to the oath. So I guess that's one of the questions I have is like, we, this season is about Ned, you know, sticking to his, his honor and his oath and really, you know, that's his downfall. But then we're also setting up John who's now locked into this oath and he is sort of forced to stick with it. And, you know, where do we see that going for John? You know, does sticking to his oath ultimately benefit him or is it ultimately going to do him harm? So it's tricky because I feel like there's two different ways to approach that, right? Because we see two different ways of it being approached, both in the show and in the books, right? It's weird because the only difference between the two is that in the books, we don't really get to see the after effects of it, right? Because they do they do still line up like with the same outcome with him being stabbed, right? By his, by the, his fellow brothers in the Night's Watch in season five, but it happens for vastly different reasons in the books than it does in the show. Because the thing is, is that, John, in a weird way, kind of has something that Ned and Rob don't, which is, you know, he has a red priestess to quite literally bring him back to life after his screw-up and mistake, right? Because John, in a weird way, up until that moment, is following the same track that both Ned and Rob did, right? They, they, you know, they were following their honor. They were trying to do the right thing. They let their honor get the best of them. They didn't take into account the people that the people around them might not all be, be all that trustworthy. And then it backfired and got them killed. The only, literally the only difference is that John had a red priestess to bring him back to life. You know, it yeah, happened John, with gets a, little, John gets a second chance. John gets he, a second he, chance. He, he learns from his error. Right. And then, 
you know, goes in a completely different direction. So, right. for, well, um, for the most part, like, we'll, we'll get to that with the later phases, but I feel like that's a big thing because the whole thing is that in the books, uh, sorry, in the show, it's the idea that they stab him over the wildlings. But the ironic thing is that, and I find it really interesting that you brought that up, which is that, so you know how in the show, John doesn't even get the letter about that kind of brings him into the fold with Ramsey and everything until after he comes back to life? Yeah. In the books, that's the event that gets him killed, that very event. Because the whole thing is throughout all of book five, right, which is John's arc throughout season five. He's elected Lord Commander. He's doing, you know, he executes Janos Slint. He's doing all of these things in order to get the wall ready and prep for the invasion. Because his whole thing is, right, Stannis makes him the offer to become John Stark, the King of Winterfell. And his whole thing is he's fully in the mindset of screw the realms. We have to get ready for the white Walker attack. Cause that is coming, you know, like he is doing, throwing all of his might into the wildlings, right. And the, into protecting the wildlings. And the whole thing is that even though the night's watch doesn't like it, the night's watch is behind him enough because there's been enough of them that so, that survived the fist of the first men that understood the threat. So the night's watch is not necessarily as divided in the books and as it is in the show, the difference being is that there's a series of events. Obviously, the interactions with bringing the wildlings out don't go smoothly, right? You have all this weird, like, kind of Red Priestess stuff with Mance. Like, there's a lot of magic that's in, introduced in that book. And then it ends with John after putting all of his effort into staying out of the conflict, right? He doesn't know if Stannis is still alive, if Stannis survived the attack because Stannis is stuck in the snow and unlike the show, it's left ambiguous as to whether Stannis is still alive or not. We last leave off with Stannis actually capturing Theon's sister. The way that it ends is he receives the letter. Ramsay tells him that um, that Stannis is dead, and uh, but he but. There's a whole other thing with Rickon, and that is what causes John to basically say, okay, we can't stay out of this anymore. I have to do something, and it's his decision to go south and fight Ramsay with the wildlings that causes the Night's Watch to turn on him and betray him. So as far as the oaths go, like I said, it's definitely... I can't really say because it's still, for the most part, following the books, but there is kind of a difference as far as how John treats the oaths across the different property. Because, like I said, because and we'll get into this at a later point, but to me, the divergence from the books happened long before season six. Gotcha. You know, yeah. it's, so it's it's one it's, of those things lot, like that. That's my two cents on kind of how yeah, oaths are treated yeah. in this world. Like definitely, you know, it's it's a great time to bring it up because he does take his oath. The oath is the downfall, and Ned. There's a little bit of a parallel here in the TV series, but like you say, it's going to sort of have an impact as we continue to go on throughout the series. Yes, and definitely, I'm inter- You know, I didn't read the books. You read the books, obviously. And it's interesting to hear the differences between yeah, it's a lot. Um, how it's handled in both yeah. uh, properties, like you said. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into this later on in season five. But honestly, like yeah. the, I, I think the biggest detriment that the show committed, like I said, was before they went off the books, was split it, was trying to merge season four and five into one season. I, I think that I understood why, because chronologically, those two books happened at the same time. It's just that by that point in the series, there was just so much happening that they kind of had to they kind of like had to diverge in you know in the books but like there was so much that got cut and the worst part is they added something that like i mean we'll get into that at a later point but there's so much interesting stuff that happened in that book that was like setting us up for like a crazy finale but really the only other big thing right is so ned obviously sending the letter to stannis right still we we don't actually see stannis in physical form in this season but the big thing right is so ned specifically goes out of his way to write on the the will that Robert has him write, uh, you know, leave it in the name of Robert's heir, right? Thinking that, like, you know, his good wordage will both spare Robert the pain of knowing the truth and also kind of save his face with Cersei, right? As as far as that goes. Um, but I definitely think it's interesting how Ned is so devout to the line of succession when, you know... Well, I, I like how he's dedicated to bureaucracy to the point where, well, well, that, well, like... Well, T- 20 years later, it's like they find out he's not the right heir. And well, well just that's, like, that's the hey, funniest part is the fact that Ned, <laughs> Ned right? You you mentioned it before, right? It's kind of the whole thing that goes in line with it, right? Ned's dedication to his oaths gets him killed. It's like Ned just doesn't seem to have this understanding that it's like, bro, you literally just had a giant war to take the throne, right? And the only reason why they were able to like kind of how he was kind of able to delude, to delude himself is that Robert 
and the Baratheons are distant cousins of the Targaryens, which is what gives Robert the claim, right? But Jorah even says it in that scene with Daenerys, right, kind of linking everything together, which is that when Aegon the Conqueror conquered Westeros, do you think that they gave him because he's, you know, because he, he believed that it was in line? No, he took it because he wanted to. And that's kind of, if we if we can kind of like, you know, peek into the, into the focus character segment a bit, right, our focus character for tonight is Cersei Lannister. Cersei Lannister doesn't have that much screen time in this episode, but the reason why I chose her is because to me, her two biggest moments of this season come from this episode. First, we the first one we already talked about, obviously being the confrontation with Ned, but the second one being the final throne room scene, right? After Robert's death, right? Ned, Littlefinger, Varys, and all these city watch members walk into the throne room, right, in this big grand show. Ned gives them the letter that Robert wrote for the will. He gives it to Sir Barristan, and Cersei just literally takes one look at the letter. She doesn't even care about the wordage or anything. She just rips it up and is like, look, we're staking our claim. This is ours now. You know, Joffrey is king. And you could either get in line or and it's like, and you can either get in line or you can get out of the way, the hard way, literally, as we see. You know, Joffrey, as we, this is also kind of the first indication of Joffrey's petulance, right? Because we know that Joffrey is all about, like, just making emotional decisions on the whim, right? Because it's Joffrey's decision in two episodes that, in a way, starts the war, right? It's kind of how every character has their part to play. But this is the moment where Cersei literally says, it's like, is this meant to be your shield? A piece of paper. It's, it's kind of, she's consistently giving Ned the warning. It's like, and, and that was literally her last chance. She's like, this is your last chance like get in line proclaim joffrey king she's like she's giving him she's giving him the opportunity to get out while the getting is good and he still will not at that point it's literally like i constantly think back to like this story the ones that one of my friends told me about how this one guy at a party he wasn't white but he, he was kind of quite liberally using the n-word and he was told repeatedly to stop otherwise he was gonna get beat up and after a while it, it's just like look there's nothing else we can do. Have at him. You know, like the one guy that was like trying to constantly go for bat, go to bat for him. But it's like, dude, you, 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 you dug your own grave as far as that goes. But, uh, I feel like that's kind of a good comparison as to what's happening here with Ned, because he just, it, it's, it's not even to the point where the writing's on the wall. It is literally, the, the paper is in front of him. The paper is right in front well, of him, like up close. I, and personal I think when to you his talk face. about, yeah, when you talk about the confrontation between Cersei and Ned, Ned is bringing up this whole idea. I, I know why, you know, John Aaron got killed. I know right. what he was seeking, you know, and, and Cersei basically says you either win or you die. Yeah. And like, basically, basically she has the confidence that she is going to win. And she's basically telling him that. Yeah. And, you know, what is your option? If I'm going to win, you know, basically Cersei's saying, if I'm going to win, Ned, you are going to die. Like that's that's yeah. the well, the you know, problem. You know here. what it is. You know why I love this moment because it just brings up to me. It, it's kind of it, it's this consistent theme that I found that goes across kind of all of the great shows that I love. Right? It's been in Sopranos. It's been in Breaking Bad. It's been in The Wire. You know, like it's a, a big moment for me in Mad Men. Right? I don't know if you've watched Mad Men, but at the end of season one. Um, there's a moment, right, where Pete Campbell, who's another employee of Sterling Cooper, who's under Don Draper, finds out famously about that Don Draper, you know, faked his identity, and he tries to bring it up to Burt Cooper in the sense of, like, you know, kind of, he, he's just a little weasel that's trying to, like, you know, work his way up the company ladder and kind of subservient Don, but Burt literally tells him straight up to his face, it's like, who cares, you know, like, if, if, I know what you're trying to do, you're trying to get ahead, and by, by doing this and it's not going to work as far as that goes you know it's kind of this constant show of like you know relying on this on this rule book it's a big part of the wire right kind of relying on this rule book right this, this supposed like set of you know purported principles that everyone you think will abide by is not going to save you and in fact if you if, if you depend on that if you live your life by that way then you're you're going to get hurt in a lot of different ways because not everyone plays by the same rules in fact hardly anyone does and when it comes to situations like this you're right all that matters is winning and getting on top and people don't care how they do it at all so it's like you either got to play it smart or make sure that if you're getting in it that way that you're going to win this because there's only one other solution yeah and i feel like this episode you know cersei is not necessarily in a lot of the episode right but for the most part this episode is setting up the whole idea that hey ned your final enemy is cersei yeah. Like now that Robert is sort of on his deathbed and he's out the door and he's pretty much like 99% going to die, you essentially have to do something to stop Cersei from taking the throne. 
And throughout the rest of the episode, we see him scramble. It's all about, you know, uh, Renly sort of offering to sort of give him the men as long as, you know, the understanding is Renly becomes king. Uh, Forget Stannis. uh, Forget, you know, everything else about how things should be. This is the way it is. Right. You know, and he denies that. And then Littlefinger basically tells him, listen, the power is there to you, for you to seize. Like, let's make Renly king. You know, let's get rid of Joffrey, make Renly king. And Ned still refuses to give up this notion of, you know, the proper succession. Uh, and right. it, it's, it, Cersei is just, she doesn't have to be there. Her right. whole, but, her but whole, her whole presence is felt as far as that goes. And I'll tell you how there. else that factors in. I'll tell you how else that factors in because it factors into the one other thing, the one other way in which Cersei can get to Ned in a way that there is nothing that Ned can do about that, which is Ned's sympathy for innocence. Because at the end of the day, as heinous as Joffrey is at later points, right? At the end of the day, in the current moment, Joffrey is still innocent of anything. He has no knowledge of his parentage. He's not king yet. He just watched his fa- his supposed father die, right? Joffrey is still innocent of this moment, right? And his whole thing is, and George R. R. Martin has talked about this frequently as far as, you know, what influences Ned's decision is Ned was disgusted by Robert's reaction and to the murdering of the Targaryen children, right? But Ned's whole thing is is that as much of a soldier as he is, he cannot stand to see innocents get hurt, right? Like, I'm talking like women, specifically women and children. And his whole thought process in confronting Cersei was trying to give her a warning in order to protect her and her children from Robert, knowing that Robert was going to do so. Like, just that whole mentality there, right? So I'm like, so, so you're going to let this kind of bullshit honor system, right, allow you to, in a way, almost actively contribute to the more murder of women and children. Because again, say for some instance that Robert had, um, you know, had made it out of that Godswood and that encounter alive, right? First of all, I don't, I still don't know if he would have given the reaction that he would have given and that like it would have gone differently per se, but like say that whatever delusion Ned was thinking of how this would go would actually happen, right? Thinking that Robert would be able to single-handedly face off against Tywin Lannister, of all people, right? Um, that's something that even John Aaron would, would have, that, that not even John Aaron would have done, right? Which well, I think, that- I think the whole idea Ned would, you know, let's say Robert didn't get injured, he's perfectly healthy, he tells him about it. Basically, Ned would say, I'm going to get my bannermen, uh, you know, everyone that backs me and we're going to basically clean up King's Landing and we're going to get you out from under this sort of the thumb of the Lannisters uh, that we've seen set up throughout the rest of the season. Right. And I think that's sort of his big ploy. But once it becomes uh, a little more of the squabbling, uh, as Robert put it, where it's, you know, basically the Lannisters will do anything to seize power. Right. A- any dirty trick, you know, there's no honor. Basically, once it gets into that game, Ned doesn't know how to play. Right. And therefore, that's that's ultimately what leads to what happens in the next couple episodes. No, you're right. You're 100% right as far as that goes. It's a simple matter of Ned vastly overest- underestimated his enemies, and then he ends up in the position where he is at the end of the episode with a knife at his throat, basically. So that's pretty much it as far as everything that we could talk about really with the episode. Uh, I wanted to bring up a couple of comments, obviously, from our loyal devotee, that being Eric Thorpe. Um, what's it called? Uh, he's, he, as, as he said, he thinks Ned was trying to give Cersei an out in his mind by giving her a heads up to prepare before he revealed the truth. That's 100% correct. It's just a matter of, I, I guess he just didn't realize that it's like, oh, he was trying to give the other side an edge when the other side was already like 10 steps ahead of him and he just didn't realize it as far as that goes. Um, another thing that he brought up that I thought was really interesting is kind of how it's literally the trilogy of the odd number full length seasons of Starks blowing it. Season one, Ned, season three, Rob, and season five, John. I thought that was really funny and it's very, very true. Um, uh, what's it called? Yeah. More honor, 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 honor. That's a word, quite frankly, that I feel like the show got sick of as far as that goes. Um, and then well, he said, after this season, right? It's yeah, once it's once honor, Ned's honor, gone. Once Ned's gone, honor is out the window, quite literally. Even yeah, starts. And he also brought up another funny point where you're like, yeah, everyone that's in this episode eventually dies by the end of the show, which is like, I like, I, yeah, I mean, if it weren't for Sam being in the episode, that literally everyone dies since John does die as well. That is a good point because I've completely forgot about that. 
Uh, well, yeah. wait, does, Sam doesn't die at some point. <laughs> no, he does not die at any point. I think wow. it's weird because the way no, because it's weird because actually in the books, if if I can get like quickly onto that tangent, there is a point where Sam does come across a faceless man in disguise. That's how it ends. That's the last point that we see Sam in the book. Sam literally gets to um it happens a little differently in the books how is Sam um you know as far as when Sam leaves to go to the citadel but Sam basically gets to the citadel right he meets his one maester tells him about Daenerys right he's like peace out i'm going to find Daenerys and then he basically con- meets with this faceless man that's posing as somebody and then it ends and that and that that that, that, that chapter just ends as far as that goes. So there, there's a lot that we get into as far as Sam's journey and what he goes through in the books because there's a lot, obviously, that is also left out that, that's kind of condensed. But I also just did want to give a quick shout-out to AJ as well. AJ, thanks for tuning in again. Uh, winter is coming. Love the series. Keep up the good work. Thanks, man. And then... The only really that we have left to get through is the death count, which we had a significant amount of death in this episode. We said goodbye to another main cast member. We're two for two so far, two back-to-back in a row. Viserys last week and this week we said we bid goodbye to Robert Baratheon, Mark Addy. A strong seven-episode run, definitely. It's kind of hard to imagine that like, for somebody who has such a strong presence throughout the entirety of the rest of the show, right? Robert Baratheon is only in seven episodes of the 73, and Ned, who we'll get to, obviously, in two episodes, is only in nine episodes it's it's, you know not counting the younger versions of himself that appear as far as you know sean bean and mark addy they're both only in those amount of episodes it's kind of insane when you consider that as far as that goes and the only and uh we had a couple of other deaths obviously we famously had um the rest of poor ned's guards ned i just feel so bad for ned's guardsmen because they every single one of them that comes to king's landing is just brutally murdered and it's not even just like the guardsmen it's like all just like kind of the regular members of his house that came with him just like everyone that was stuck in king's landing that didn't go out with barrett don darian is just murdered just well, like to be honest with you, chance. the only one that survives is the one that goes to Stannis. <laughs> you know? So, uh, who knew I that get, guy was getting such a good deal? Who, who, when he picked out the straws, like who was going to go? Like, was it a matter if he picked out the straws, or was it just a matter of Ned just selected this one guy? He's like, that's the most reliable guy. And that guy was like, that guy probably is still on Dragon. So just look back. He's like, oh man, that's the bullet there, or that's the yeah, spears he, there. <laughs> he probably had to seek out the only therapist in the realm. <laughs> to be honest with you, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't know. You know, whatever. I guess it would be a maester. It would be. Yeah, it would probably be a like maester that. as far as that goes, because the, I don't think therapy exists in medieval times, basically. But um, unless you have anything else to add, that was pretty much. Uh, our our talk our and latest episode of Talking Thrones on you win or you die basically. We only yeah, had three episodes left this, of season one. I, it's kind I, of I, insane. I think, I think this episode is sort of a sleeper episode. Like obviously it is. last week was sort of, you know, the golden crown and such a big death. And, you know, we get another big death in this uh, episode, but it's really just, it's more about the implication of, of what's going to happen next. Yes. Um, and really this is what sets in motion. Uh, the, the, this is the spark of that war between the Lannisters and uh, the Starks. And we're going to see really how it unfolds. Um, and it could throughout. actually, it, it there was an actual chance that it could have ended, uh, you know, in a, a very diplomatic way, or at least a, a uh, less bloody way. But uh, you know, that's thrown out the the door uh, because of the whims of a child. Because King. of the whims of a child, ultimately. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about that in a couple episodes. When we get to it, Eric. Thank you for bringing that up. That's actually hilarious as far as that goes. <laughs> I think Sam would be actually be a really good therapist. <laughs> Maybe he's the one to bring therapy into Westeros when he becomes Grand Maester at Maybe. the end of the show. Maybe. Maybe he, p- Maybe he picks up that book. You know, the Secrets of Therapy. The, the Secrets uh, of Therapy. The, lost in that, edition. In, in, in that endless <laughs> kind of amount of like just lost scrolls and text at the library. Yeah. yeah. So that, many that's uh, Bob. That's Bob's work. He just never finished it. And then Sam picks it up. And it's all about it's all about kind of how you know how people think and, and soldiers the after effects of sh- soldiers dealing with battle. But uh, people, once again, thank you for tuning into another episode of Talking Thrones. We'll be back next week for episode eight, entitled "The Pointy End," and then we've got two more episodes after that. And then we're going to take a one week break. There's going to be a one week break in between seasons one and two, so keep that in mind. I'll continue to say that in the next couple weeks in order to reinforce that. But we're doing a big shoot that weekend, so we will neither of us will be available for that weekend. So we're going to be taking a break. So we'll be coming back two weeks after the end of season one for the premiere of season two, but we'll be back next week, same time as usual for episode eight, the point the end, and you can keep up to date with everything that's going on both with this show and with the main show, the Talking TV podcast by following us on Instagram and Facebook at Talking TV podcast. You can also click the like button and the subscribe button on this video. 
able to just help out the channel in general overall. And like I said, keep up to date with everything that we've got going on with the channel on our social media profiles. Pat, where can the good people find you? Hey, listen, uh, I'm just directing everybody to my Instagram at Patrick W. Huber. Uh, I'll post on it. Maybe. Someday. Maybe. Or, someday. or maybe I'll figure out another social we'll media, which I'll use. But uh, Instagram is the spot to check out some things right now. Absolutely. And you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram on my personal pages, Movie Nerd Reviews, all one word. I post some occasional sarcastic posts here and there. But it's mostly just a fun page in order to promote everything that I do here on the Talking TV channel. I wanted to thank everyone that's continuing to show up for these reviews. Again, we've got a ton more episodes to do. We're not stopping anytime soon. So remember, people, as always, 12 seasons in a short film. Watch more fucking movies, and winter is indeed still coming. We'll catch you guys next time.